uh, as you know, last week I was supposed to do this, and uh, instead I was not prepared due to some circumstances that came up, and I just wasn't to the point where I was comfortable to, to bring this lesson, and Brian thankfully stepped in uh, with the Sunday surprise, and it was a good one too, a very good message. Um, so this week I am as prepared as I think I am going to be, so um, let's just get right into it. So Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity we have to come here and gather around your word to learn from it. I thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to hone and, and practice the skill of teaching it. Just pray that it'll be your word that's magnified and it'll be to the edification that, uh, to those that have come out and those that are listening online. In Christ's name, amen. So, as you know, as you see there, the very first word in chapter 5 there is therefore. So, I want to turn back to the beginning of Romans in chapter 1. And we're just going to go through and look at a couple verses because... The therefore is therefore all of the things that he's talked about to this point in, in Romans. So I'm just going to highlight a, verse, a couple verses as we go through here. So if we look at uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, we, we see that, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation unto everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So we're talking about the power of God there. If we go to verse 18... It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. So Paul expounds upon how the wrath of God, he's making the case um, for uh, basically why we, we need a Savior and a salvation. And he talks about how the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. And then we go down to... Verse 23, uh, chapter, well, go to 319, and it says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Paul talks about and makes a case for why all of the world, both Jew and Gentile, are all guilty before God. And then if you uh, go down to verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then we get into the wonderful thing about, in verse 24 there, uh, it talks about being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So Paul starts to talk about the grace of God and how we're justified by the grace of God. And in verse 25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. So we talk about how faith comes into play, and then Paul starts talking about more, talking more about faith. Look at verse 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And then we get into chapter 4, and it talks about how it is, it is uh, of grace, again, not of him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And then we get into, and this is talking more about faith, if we look at verse 16 in chapter 4, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And then we go down to verse 24, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus, raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who delivered us for our, who was delivered for our offensive offenses, and was raised again for our justification. So Paul, and I went through that very fast because we got a lot of material to get through, but I wanted to get kind of set the stage for where Paul starts in chapter 5. Therefore, all of the stuff that we talked about, and in the very previous verse where it says, who was delivered for our offenses, that is Jesus Christ our Lord, delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. And therefore, being justified. Notice that... The word being there, it is existing in a certain state. 
a standing. We are being justified. It's a present possession. We are either justified or we're not. And in this case, as you can see by the verses there, you know, being justified. So up to this point, Paul has assumed that the reader is justified. <clears throat> so note that we are justified by faith. It is by faith. Notice that, again, Paul assumes that at this point in Romans, the reader has heard the gospel of Christ, understood that God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness, that all have sinned and come short, that God has set forth Jesus Christ Jesus to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, that man is justified by faith, and that Christ was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. All of that, at this point in time, Paul has assumed the reader knows. So therefore, that reader is in the state of being justified by faith, as we noted. Turn with me to Colossians 2. And we're going to go to verse 12. Note, it says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. So again, it touches on faith. And, but notice it is the operation of God. God is the one that did this. And he did it by sending his son to shed his blood on a cross and raising, up, raising him up again. If we look, uh, flip back to Romans, and we're going to be flipping around a bunch, so in a lot of the same book uh, chapters. If we look at uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, it's by his blood we shall be saved from the wrath through him, from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It's nothing we did. We just believe in what God said is true. If we look at Romans, uh, just flip back a couple pages to Romans 4, 24 again. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. We need to believe in what God said is true, and then it is imputed to us. So, as noted, in chapter 5, therefore being justified. We've established that fact. If, at this point in time, it's assumed, like I said, that the, the reader is justified. If not, the reader goes back to the beginning of chapter 1 and works back through all that stuff again. And that's, you know, that's what brings us to the therefore being justified. So if that isn't the case, like I said, you either are or you are not justified, then you go back to square one. Recognize that you're a sinner, that the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness, and so on and so forth. God set forth Christ to be a propitiation, and so on. <clears throat> so when we look at justified, Strong's definition is to render righteous or such he ought to be. Uh, to declare, pronounce, one to be just, righteous, or such as he ought to be. As concerning God's justice against sin, based upon the fact that we are justified, we are good. We are justified. And how do we know this? Because we're reading it right there in Romans chapter 5. If we've established and believed right up into the point to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him, we know at that point in time, if we believe what God's word says, and that it is true that we be justified. So I have a number of other references. I'm not going to get into those, but um, I really, I'm going to kind of go through the next couple points a little bit quickly because I want to get into the, the point of the, or the title of the message, which is glory and tribulation. And this is the very first, the, these verses, these five verses in Romans are the first verses that I actually attempted to teach in the adult Sunday school. And, it, you know, this was almost 10 years ago, probably. And, uh, you know, I couldn't find the notes from that. And I looked for, tried to remember a lot of the points that I brought up. But I can say that going through this again this time, 10 years later, it's entirely different than, than the way that I went through it last time. And 
you know, I was talking before coming in here, as you go through and you prepare for a lesson, you, you start to find, as you dig into all these things, that there's just so many places you can go and find nuggets of wisdom and, and, and different things to expound upon what you're studying. And, you know, it just, and I don't know why it just struck me today. I mean, I think it's just kind of a given fact, but how wonderful that is about the Word of God. How, as you get into it and you study it, it's just endless in the amount of wisdom and knowledge that you can find as you study through it. It's phenomenal. So, without trying to go down all the various rabbit holes and things that, you know, you really could go down, I'm going to try and get through it quickly and stay kind of concise to my points, which I guess is the whole point of learning to, to do this. But uh, anyway, so going back to Romans 5, therefore being justified by faith, we've established the fact that we're justified, that it is by faith, and it's a standing that we have, it is a present possession. We And then the next it says, we have peace with God. Because of the fact that we're justified by faith, we have peace with God. Notice it is through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the language of a present possession, just like being justified, we have peace. It is a present possession. It's something that we have as a re result of being justified. One can construe that in an unjustified state, we did not have peace with God, right? I mean, that's the, kind of the converse of that. So flip back to Romans chapter 1 and look at verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Now, we read this verse earlier as we were going through, but you can see that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. So that is the unjustified state. Ungodly, unrighteous. We have not been made right with God if we are unjustified. And if you think about wrath, that's kind of not the same thing as peace, right? It's like exactly the opposite of that. And then if we flip ahead again to Romans chapter 5 and look at verse 10, we see that for if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Thankfully, that latter part is in there, but you notice that we were enemies when we were enemies. We were not at peace with God. We were at enemies at in enmity with God. I should probably mark my spot so I don't get lost here. Flip over to Colossians 1. And verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And then read 21. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Notice that it gives the two states there, reconciled and unreconciled. But And then at, one, at some point, you know, we were enemies in our mind by wicked works. So we were not in line and at peace with, with God. Notice though that uh, it says uh, in verse, oh, hang on a minute. Oh, notice that in, in Romans 5, just referring back to that, it says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the, our Lord Jesus Christ that gives us the ability to now have peace with God. It is through Him, through His propitiatory sacrifice on the cross, that we can have peace with God. And we'll look at Ephesians, uh, go to Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 14 says, For He is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. So it is Christ that is our peace. We have peace because we are in Christ. We have been justified and we are in Christ. We are justified in Christ and we have peace in Christ. Um, I already mentioned uh, Colossians 1.20 and having made peace through the blood of his cross. He did it by shedding his blood on, a, on the cross. There's some other references, Matthew 10.34 and Luke 12.51. I won't get into those right now. Go back to Romans and uh, let's look at ver chapter 2. I 
feel like I'm talking fast, but like I said, I want to get through this first bit so that we can spend some time in the meat of what I've got here. So Romans 2, 16, and it says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, God will judge mankind one day. For those that are in Christ, the penalty has been paid for by the blood of Christ shed on the cross. God's justice has been satisfied and justification has been imputed unto us by God through Christ. So that standing that we have, that day when God judges the secrets of men, we already know we have peace. We don't have to worry about that judgment of God because we have peace. We've been justified. God's justice has been satisfied. We can never, ever, ever re-offend the justice of God. If we could, it would mean that Christ's blood wasn't enough. Right. It's not that we can't do things that would offend God, but in terms of our eternal state and our standing, we can never do anything that can remove us or put us into a position where we are not at peace and in offense of God because we are in His Son, Jesus Christ, Amen. whom He is well pleased. So... I want let's go back to Romans 5. We'll just continue on here. Like I said, I want to go through this kind of quickly. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Additionally, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. So let's look at that part. So by whom, again, is who? It's Christ, right? By whom? Is, is the Lord Jesus Christ in the previous verse. Christ is the key to the access we have into God's grace. Just like we are justified by faith, our access is also by faith. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 17. And came and preached Peace to you which were far off and to them that were nigh. For through him, that's Christ, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. So we have access. Again, this is a present possession. We've been being justified. We have peace. We have access. All of three of those things are through Christ and are standing in Christ. Uh, just go to 3.12 in Ephesians there since we're right there. And it says, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. When I was uh, teaching on Galatians 2.20, we talked about, you know, having faith in something or uh, the faith of something or the faith in something. And we were talking about the faith of Christ and how he was faithful even to the death on the, uh, death on the cross. He was faithful to following and completing exactly what the will of the Father was. And because of the fact that Christ was faithful and we have faith in his faithfulness, we now have boldness and access with confidence. You know, that's the piece I think sometimes that is missing in our thinking. And this isn't in my notes, but, you know, when you think about that access and the boldness with confidence, we so often rely on our standing based upon our own abilities, our own uh, I guess ability to measure up to God's God's you know perfect righteous standard, and we forget or fail to rest in the fact that we have that standing in Christ, yeah. and we can be bold in that standing and be confident in that standing because it's what He did. And you know you look at the religiosity out there in the world, and it's a constant struggle to measure up. And we can rest in the fact that we have peace, we've been justified, and we have access into that grace. And I love those words, boldness and confidence. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 1. And, you know, the latter part of that verse, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Again, here's another example. Moreover, brethren, uh, if I didn't say so, verse 1, 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, 
which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. In verse 2, by which also ye are saved. Again, it is that gospel, the gospel of God's grace, is where we stand if we've received it, believed it. Um, like in 5, 2, in 1 Corinthians, you see we have a standing in Christ. It is a present possession. It is where we stand. Romans 5, 20, going back to Romans 5, and, well, I guess we'll be there for a minute. Romans 5, and then go down to verse 20. Uh, there we go. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. <laughs> we can't out sin God's grace. You know, and, and note, if you go down to the first couple verses of chapter 6, just because we can't out sin God's grace, it doesn't mean that we should go out and, and sin just because, you know, God's grace will just take care of it all. Could we do that? We could, right? But it says there in chapter 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? What's the next two words? God forbid, right? It's not what we should do, and it's the love of Christ that constrains us to not want to do that. To You know, you think about, you know, when people do something for you that you don't deserve, generally the response is, at least in the moment, you know, yeah, I really don't deserve that. I want to live up to whatever expectation or whatever it is that they thought, you know, I deserve that for, you know. And I, I just, I, I find it interesting when we think about that, you know, that we have that freedom and liberty under grace that even when we go our own way and follow after the flesh, God's grace is just much more abounding. And it doesn't matter how much, it's just, it's always enough. And, you know, that's good motivation to not want to sin anymore. So, uh, no, and let's go to Ephesians 2. And 7. Again, we want to talk about grace and this access that we have. And it says there in verse 7 that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Again, through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's nothing we did, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Again, it's nothing we did. It's not that we are so wonderful that God wanted to do this for us. It's that he loved us so much that even though we weren't wonderful, he sent his son to die on a cross. And I just wanted to know, and I came to these verses to look at um, in verse 7 there. Notice it says the exceeding riches. This abounding grace that abounds much more than sin could ever abound, it also has these exceeding riches of his grace. Um, and we're going to talk more about that as we get into it when we talk about hope. But the exceeding riches of his grace tie into hope. And that's kind of one of the beautiful things about these verses as you go through and we learn about glory and tribulation. All these points that we're talking about all tie into one another and are interconnected in one way, shape, or form or another. Um, and it really all boils down to what he's done for us in Christ and what he's going to do with it for us in Christ. Um, again... It is a present possession. When you think about the exceeding riches of His grace, we already have that. We might not have realized it in, in our you know our day-to-day -day walk in terms of what He's going to do in the ages to come and what He's going to reveal in the ages to come, but we have access to the exceeding riches of His grace in our day-to-day, -day, even still. Um, let's go to Colossians 2. Verse 6. And I also wanted to note this. Um, it says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. And how did we receive Christ Jesus the Lord? By faith. By faith. By grace through faith. So when you think about that, if, if we're supposed to walk in the same way that we received him, we walk by grace through faith. So you think about we have... This abounding grace that has taken care of 
anything we could ever do wrong. We have all these riches in grace. And uh, I didn't read it in there, but it talked about, uh, let, me, let me quick flip back there. You don't have to do it, but let me flip there a minute. Ephesians. I didn't note this, I didn't read the first part of it, or I did, and I, I went over uh, Ephesians 2, 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. That, again, we have, in the ages to come, we've, we've got these exceeding riches, we've received this, we've got that ability, or we've got that hope to look forward to, but we also have that same grace through faith that we are to walk in. It, it has given us these exceeding riches in the ages to come, but it also equips us to walk in the present day. We have been equipped for that. That brings us into the next few points, and I'm going to slow down a little bit as we go through these, perhaps. So, back to Romans chapter 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And I kind of mentioned that and alluded to it when we talk about the ages to come. Um, that is an eternal perspective when you think about it. Uh, it's a new understanding. Uh, when we look at Romans 8, let's just flip there real quick. We look at 8.17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Um, for I reckon that the sufferings, and we're going to come back to some of these verses, we reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. Um, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. We've got this eternal perspective now that we can look forward to and this present possession with that we will realize at the, with the redemption of our bodies um, just notice though that the, the joint heirs we will be made joint heirs with Christ and glorified together with him keep that in the back of your mind um, go to 2 Corinthians 4 Verse 18. Note, it says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things that are seen are temporal. That would be the things around us, the physical world in which we live in. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Again, that rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God is an eternal perspective. It's something that prior to being justified, having access into that grace, being at peace, it, it escaped the individual. Um, go to Ephesians 1, verse 18. says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And I'll keep going. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. And you think about that, we're joint heirs with Christ. And if you look at verse 20 and 21, it says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand, at the right hand of God in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. That's Christ's inheritance. That's Christ being glorified. We're joint heirs with Christ. That's ours. Amen. That's just... That's <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I love where it says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Again, we have this access into this grace that we stand in. And when you think about hope, 
you think about that that hope of glory and he says that your eyes of your your understanding be enlightened that ye may know what is the hope that you can know it we can know it god gives it to us in his word and we can know it we can have that be a reality in our thinking today that equips us to walk in a world that has no hope other than christ on a different course it has hope christ but i think you know what i'm saying um Let's go to Colossians, flip back a couple pages to Colossians chapter 1. And verse 27. To whom God would make known, and the to whom is his saints, to whom God would make, from the previous verse, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Again, which to whom God would make known this is something we can know, and it's something that hadn't been revealed in time past. It's the mystery that was given to the Apostle Paul, and that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is our hope. We have a hope and glory, an inheritance and in glory in Christ, with Christ. God is going to fill up the universe with his glory through us. He's going to utilize the church, the body, which is in Christ, to fill up the universe with his glory. Amen. He's going to be in us and through us. If we look at 2 Thessalonians, you don't have to turn there, One ten, it says, When he shall come to be glorified in his saints, we take part in Christ's glorification. Having that eternal perspective, that focusing on the eternal versus the temporal, does something in our day-to-day -day lives. It is a view of how God sees things as opposed to how we view our circumstances in the world. So back to Romans 5. Man, time is cruising. Wow. All right. Yeah, I got to fly here. Romans 5, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein ye stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. <laughs> and this is, the, this is the part right here. So, so far, we have established this high point of our standing. We have, we're, we've been justified, it's a present possession, we have peace with God, we have access all through, by faith, through Christ. We have access into this grace wherein we're standing in this grace. And we can rejoice in the hope of the glory, eternal glory ahead. But not only that, not only that, we glory, but we glory in tribulations also. So you take all that high point of wonderful things that we are, and Paul takes us and he says, but we can glory in tribulation also. And generally speaking, when we think about tribulation, we're not thinking about it as a good thing. But when we think about that eternal perspective, we've got these things out here in the future that we can look forward to, this sure hope, we're still here in the flesh. And that is where we live the grace life. That walk that we have in grace. The now, where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. We look at the definition of tribulation in Merriam-Webster, and I, you know, kind of uh, paraphrase some of it because there's a lot there. It says, distress or suffering resulting from oppression or persecution, a trying experience. Examples of those could be illness or bad luck, financial problems, heartache, um, grief, turmoil, gloom, stress, depression. There's some things that, when you look at this, it talks about not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And you look at that word knowing, there's some things that we can know and understand about tribulation and how it works in the life of the believer. If we look at, if we flip a couple pages over to Romans 8, we look at verse 18, and this is where, really, as we start to go through a lot of these verses, they just we're going to be bouncing back and forth because they touch on a lot of the points that I'm going to bring up. A lot of the same verses do. Romans 8, 18, For I reckon 
that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We already talked about the glory that is going to be revealed in us. And, you know, when we talk about reckoning, that's like uh, accounting or a reckoning something to be so. And Paul's talking and he's saying, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, which I would say would count as tribulation, they're not worthy to be compared. So, a couple things about tribulation. Um, it's a reality. So Romans 18 there says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, there is going to be some present time sufferings. But notice, and as you think about the verses in Romans 1, uh, or 5, 1 through 5, notice there's a connection between suffering and the glory that's to come. You know, when you think about that, you know, you glory in tribulation also, and then you talk, and then you get to the end of those verses, and it talks about hope again, that hope of glory, and he ties it back into glory, you know, but notice in that verse, they're tied directly together. The sufferings are not worthy to comp be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. So, some sources of tribulation in the world, when you think about it, we live in a sin-cursed creation. Like I said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time um, if we look at Romans, while well, we're right there, let's look. Well, Romans 8, uh, 22, it says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Um, so we know it's a whole creation thing. And also, notice that, again, it says that we should know this. We know that all the whole creation is groaneth and travaileth. We know these things. It's a reality. So another way, another source of tribulation is the choices that we or others make in our walk, the fruit of our choices, right? Sin has a payday. Sometimes you can escape that payday, but, it, you know, thankfully, the ultimate eternal payday Christ has taken care of. But as it relates to our walk and the circumstances of our life, we make choices sometimes that have a negative impact on us that cause tribulation, angst, financial problems, heartache, grief, whatever, and also the choices of others. We are subject to the ramifications of the choices of other people in our lives sometimes. I would say as being a parent, there's very evident, you know, we're very much impacted and go through tribulation because of the choices of our children. Um, and I know that I put my parents through a lot of heck because of that. And then the other one is, uh, and we'll go to the verse uh, in 2 Timothy. <clears throat> Second Timothy 3, verse 12, it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So the third real reason why is if you're living godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to suffer persecution. And that, we've, and we've talked about it a lot of times. Um, we've been fortunate, we live in a country that we live in where we have the freedom to be able to gather and worship and, and pursue, uh, you know, pursue our, our belief and, and pursue uh, teaching it and, and getting together and everything else. There's areas in the world where you cannot do that and people suffer persecution. There's fear now of that being the case here. As things continue, our culture seems to be going out of control. There's a very negative perspective on you know, all things related to the Bible. And you know, as such, we can expect there to be persecution. You know, I can't remember the exact verse reference, but Paul talks about being the off-scouring, you know. That's kind of the view that the world begins to have on us. And as such, we're going to suffer persecution, suffer tribulation, suffer angst, suffer being the outsider. All those things that, as a person, you want that acceptance, and it has an impact on us. It does cause tribulation and angst. So, God can and does use that for a purpose that results in some things. Tribulation, that is. And when we look at, going back to Romans 5, when we look at those things, it says, not only so, in verse 3, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing, again, we've got the ability to know some things there, but we should know some things, that tribulation worketh patience. And patience, experience, and experience hope. So, right in those verses, God's telling us, 
that tribulation can work some things in our life to our benefit. So the first one there that we notice is patience. Romans 12, verse 12, notice it says rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Is it, is the natural man generally patient in tribulation? <clears throat> no, we want out of it, right? We want out of it right now. And there's not a whole lot of patience there. Like when you're suffering through whatever it is in life, all you want is for whatever that is, that is that's causing you to suffer to end. And, you know, patience is not natural. Um, but, you know, again, notice the tie in there. Hope is mentioned in that verse. Patience and tribulation. And then he adds something there. Continuing instant in prayer. Prayer is tied to that ability for us to be patient. We'll, we'll get into that more. So, the ability that we have to be patient in, in tribulation is tied directly to the access that we have into God's grace wherein we stand in Romans 5 2. Um, and let's look at a verse to kind of exemplify that. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to get through all this. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse 7. And it says, this is talking about the thorn in the flesh. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Notice Paul's response. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So notice that it says there, first of all, you cannot miss this. Christ's answer is, my grace is sufficient. I'm looking to see if I can cruise through some of this. So, and then I wanted to also note that made perfect in weakness, and when I am weak, then I am strong. Notice that also he says, those uh, first five words in verse 9 are, and he said unto me. So it is about what God says, belief in what God says. So prior to that verse, Paul wanted out of the tribulation. He besought the Lord thrice, let it depart from me. Whatever it was, there's lots of speculation. We don't need to know that. All we need to know is that Paul, like us, wanted out. He wanted out of the tribulation, and God had some words, some information for Paul to know that he can then apply to the situation. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. In Paul's response, we have an ability to respond to God's, the truth of God's word about the situation that we have, and that's a great example of that. Um, and then, you know, again, he no, notice in verse 10, he says, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, based upon what God said to me, that my, his grace is sufficient, I'm going to glory in my infirmities, and I'm going to take pleasure in my infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, and distresses. So that's a whole different mindset when you think about it. Totally different way of thinking. Not a natural way of thinking. And not Paul's initial way of thinking. So, <clears throat> again, I want to, I'm, I'm going to kind of go through this quickly. So let's go to, so first of all, he says, my grace and the power of Christ. There's two, those two things are mentioned in there. My grace is sufficient and that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And when you think about that, for when I am weak, then I am strong. It, it isn't us. Like, we're not enduring the affliction. It's the power of Christ that might rest upon us. For when I'm weak, when we come to the end of ourselves and let 
the truth of God's word and the power of Christ be what works in us, that's where we want to be. We don't want to be relying upon ourselves. We want to rely on him. So, again, we talked about that grace. He says, my grace is sufficient. We have a standing in grace. Um, go to 2 Corinthians. We don't want to miss this. Uh, 9, 8. Just flip back a couple pages. <clears throat> And, and it says there, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Amen. Remember, we were talking about abounding grace that abounds much more than sin could ever abound. Now we're not talking about sin. We're talking about that ye always having all sufficiency in how many things? All things. All things may abound to every good work. So when, he, when Paul's being told that my grace is sufficient for thee, what does this verse say? It confirms that. You always have all sufficiency. All grace is abounding towards you, Paul. You always have all sufficiency in everything. Even that thorn in the flesh that you wanted gone and asked me to get rid of three times. And, you know, when you think about abounding in every good work, we're going to get into that when we talk about experience, I think. But, you know, don't forget that. Keep that in the back of your mind if we get that far. Um... So I'm going to skip through some things, and I'm going to summarize those. So again, like I said, we've got, he uses tribulation for a purpose, the first of which is patience. And patience and tribulation. That patience you could call peace under pressure. And again, that isn't natural. That's not the natural man. That comes from God. That is something that we have access into. Like we mentioned there, we have um, all sufficiency in grace, in God's grace, in our standing in God's grace. As life comes at us, and we learn to apply God's word to our situations, and we see it effectually work. That was evident in those verses that we read. Paul had life coming at him. He had the thorn in the flesh. He asked God to remove it. He, God told him, my grace is sufficient, and Paul changed his thinking, and it effectually worked. He's glory, you know, he, it change of mind. But as we do that, we can see it effectually work when we believe it. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 As we do that, Time and time again, we gain experience. And that's the second thing that God uses tribulation for. Notice again in, in Romans 5. I know I keep coming back there, but I want to make sure we drive this home. Romans 5, it says, there, uh, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience works experience. It's working some things. So again, um, experience, when you think about experience, experience is skill in handling problems. So when you have an issue, whatever it may be, you, you want, let's say you want to add an addition to your house. You don't seek out somebody who's never swung a hammer in their life. You go find somebody that's got some experience. You know, especially if you're going to do it yourself. You're going to go find somebody that's got experience and say, hey, you know, how would you approach this? Or working on a vehicle, whatever the case may be. Um, you you want to rely on or lean on somebody that's got some experience. And, you know... Experience is also the ability to prove out a solution. So as we go through life and we, by patience, apply God's grace and the hope that we have in glory to the various situations, let that work itself out. Um, oh, there was a verse reference about uh, that you may prove, and I can't remember what it was right now, but uh, it's a great, yes, that's a great reference about how, you know, that we may prove, uh, basically prove out those solutions, the solutions that we find in God's Word. And, you know, it's that practice that we have in handling problems in a successful manner. And God is faithful. God's Word will work effectually when we believe it. Go to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. And verse 8. It says, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia. Uh, this would be back in Acts 19, the whole uh, Diana and the, uh, the silversmith and all that stuff. That we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. So again, you know, in thinking about like depression, that pretty much sums it up right there, right? Pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But 
We have the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raises the dead. Who did what? Delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver. In whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. And then if you look at, uh, oh, verse 11, it says, Ye also, helping together by prayer for us. Notice that, you know, in talking to the Corinthians, he's talking about how their prayer also helped. And I mentioned that prayer further back. But there's a benefit to sharing tribulation within the body of Christ and the ability we have to pray for one another and to support one another in prayer. Um, <clears throat> Again, I just want to draw attention to the fact that it talks about that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God. It's not in our capacity to deal with this situation. And note that it says that He will yet deliver us. God will deliver us. One way, shape, or form, we will be delivered from the situation that we're in right now. Notice, again, like I said, the Corinthians were helping by prayer. Um, go to Philippians. We've got a few verses in Philippians, and we're going to go to Philippians 11 first here. Or 4, 11, sorry. It says, Not that I, res I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know, well, I'll stop there. So again, I want to note the fact that Paul says that he has learned. Paul is a human being just like all the rest of us. He had to learn some things. Learn some things through experience, right? And he says, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am. It doesn't matter what state I am, I can be content. And then he talks about the various states that he can be content in. Um, and then if we go to, well, I did want to talk about verse 12. Um, and I know how, both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. It isn't Paul relying on his own ability, it's Christ strengthening him. Back up to verse 9. And note says, Those things which ye have both learned and received, and heard, and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Notice that Paul is, right before he starts getting into all the circumstances that he's dealt with in life, and how he's learned some things, he's telling the Philippians, hey, what you've received, and learned from me, and seen in me, do that. And guess what, guys? The God of peace will be with you too. How did he know? He just said he learned it through experience. Um, okay, I'm going to have to skip ahead here because I do want to wrap at a spot here. Again, uh, did Paul, Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul talks about not having any rest in his spirit. He asks who is sufficient for these things. He notes that uh, I think it's in 415, our sufficiency is of God. It's not in our sufficiency, it's of God. Um, and again, did, did Paul get a greater measure of grace than any other believer? Yeah. I mean, even though he had Christ appear to him on the road to Damascus, he got the same measure of grace that any one of us did. He got the same capacity, and he took all of his experience and he wrote it down for us. We have his experience to draw upon. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We have an open time slot in November. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Revisited do? Yeah. Um, no kidding. Uh, I wanted to spend some time on hope. But, uh, you know, we talked about hope already and... I, I, I'll probably skip over that and get to like the closing here in just a couple minutes. But, um, you know, again, I want to I want to underscore this experience piece. And, no, you know, again, that patience that we have to have, that patience that comes from the Holy Ghost. Um, 
you know, through God's word being applied to the circumstances and how in that we have experience that we accumulate over time. And, and as we test, we test and try out God's word in our lives. We work out our salvation. Go to, uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians. I've got a couple verse references and then I'll close. Um, 1 Corinthians uh, 1. Yeah, I'll probably take that spot in November. It's all like you have done or Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. 1 Corinthians 1, and let's look at 3 through 7. Grace be unto you and peace. And I, I, it's, again, this is assuming that all, he's speaking to believers. Paul says it in all of his epistles. Grace be unto you and peace. From God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given to you by Jesus Christ. Um, uh, the verse I want to get to, uh, verse 7. So that ye come behind in no gift waiting for... I must have put down the wrong reference. I was going to do the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted. Did I skip that? Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians. That's why I just missed the. That's why. Thank you. Let's go there real quick. I don't want to skip that. Second Corinthians one. Thank you. Always bound to be a, a bad verse reference in here. Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comfort us, comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. How? By the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Again, that experience, now we have the ability to take that experience just like the carpenter that has the experience and, and wants to help out a friend in need and takes that experience and shares that experience with them and or the person that needs to draw upon the experience of somebody else and goes to somebody who has more experience, either experience and skill in God's word and the application of God's word or in dealing with situations that you're going through, all those different circumstances, all of those things uh, are available through that experience that we gain through trusting God's word in the circumstances of our life. Um, again, Romans 15, 13 says, fill you with all joy and peace in believing. That joy and peace in tribulation is in believing that God's word will do what it says it's going to do. And let's go to, uh, this is how I would conclude and go into hope, but let's go to 15, Romans 15, 4. Um, Romans 15, 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Again, when you think about the things that are written for time, those are in time past, right? In the, in the Old Testament, in you know, God's dealing with Israel. And it doesn't say written for our instruction. It says written for our learning. There's a lot of things, like you think of Job and, and other circumstances in life where God is faithful to get people through circumstances. We have all this available for us to draw upon in God's word. And it is through patience and the comfort of the scriptures. The scriptures gives us patience and comfort when we study it and believe it and relate it to the circumstances of our life. And again, that was the segue into hope, which was the other thing that I wanted to mention about tribulation, in that it says the, patient, the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And hope is a confident expectancy of things to come, but we're not going to get into that. So, I wanted to kind of mention... So it's funny, my, my wife has said this a few times. You know, she talks about a, some circumstances in her life that have come up where just the chips are down and you're just at despair. There's fear. There's all kinds of things going on. And she was just highlighting the fact that it seems when we are in those circumstances, we tend to lean on God more than when life is just hunky-dory and we're moving along. And... It's when we come to the end of ourselves and realize that we can't do it in and of ourselves that we learn that we need to rely on God, His Word, and His Spirit to get us through a situation. And that is 
an experience that we can then take forward as we move forward in life. And really, we should apply that constant reliance uh, in everything by prayer and supplication. Um, everything we need to lean on God and share with God and have that closeness because then when the chips are down, we've got that built into our inner man that we can draw upon and the Holy Spirit can draw upon to apply it to our situation. Tribulation, and I heard this word used and I thought it was a great word, is ordained by God to produce something in our lives. Ordained is like set for a purpose. It's not that God sends the tribulation and says, okay, ha-ha, I'm going to test Will out and see how he does in that. It's in spite of the tribulation, God has ordained it if we walk by faith in grace and apply that to the circumstances, he's ordained it to produce something in our lives. And those things are patience, experience, and hope. It's an opportunity for the doctrine we have learned to work in our lives. It's utilized to benefit us spiritually. That spiritual growth that we get from relying on God's word to get us through a situation, it edifies us, it helps us to grow and mature, strengthen us in our thinking, in our skill and application of doctrine. And when you think about those three high points of being justified, having peace, and having access into the grace where we stand, and then we think about the application where the rubber meets the road, it's a natural flow of sound doctrine that the application of our eternal standing in Christ can live out and, and work out in tribulations that we experience in our lives today. So I'm going to close with that, and I will take that slot in November, and uh, um, I'll just close in prayer real quick. Lord, we just thank you for what you've done for us, in us, and will do through us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Just thank you that we are justified, we are, we are at peace with you, and that we have access into the grace wherein we stand. We thank you that that has an opportunity and ability to work out in our lives and the various tribulations and trials that we have, and that uh, we can that experience that we gain from those uh, can can strengthen us and build us up and edify our inner man, but also we can comfort others uh, that are going through similar things as well. And in Christ's name, Amen. All right, thanks, Will. Um, we're ten, five minutes past, so I'm just gonna say next Sunday will be Bud. Following Sunday on the 11th will uh, be the class on the Bible.